started. Welcome to our second webinar in the series presented by the League of Women Voters and Nonprofit Marketing Guide. We are going to talk about communications roles and planning today. I'm Kivi LaRue Miller with Nonprofit Marketing Guide. Uh, Christina, who also works with me, is here today to help us some of the logistics. And then we have Jennifer and Stephanie from the League. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Kivi. Thanks for having us. Um, this webinar is sponsored by League Easy Web, which is uh, the League's online technology used by over 260 leagues to host, create, and maintain their websites. LWV California and LWV United States have run LU collaboratively for several years. And because we're launching a new and improved LU in 2016, we're hosting this communication series. Um, Stephanie, why don't you tell everyone a little bit more about yourself and your role at LWV US too? Hi everyone, good afternoon. Um, as uh, Jennifer, Jenny said, um, I'm the Senior New Media Manager at the League in the Washington DC office and I manage our um, online communications channel. So this includes our BLAST email program, so the action alerts and engagement and elections pieces you likely receive from us. Um, and our social media channels, our, our Facebook and Twitter for both the League and Vote 411. Um, as well as our blog, so our Voices of the League blog, and um, maybe some of you have worked with me on um, guest blogs to highlight the work of the state and local leagues across the country. Uh, and then I do some general uh, other communications work and website work uh, for the office. Thank you. And Stephanie and Jenny are going to pitch in a little bit today to help customize some of this content for the league as we move along. So thank you for contributing to that. We're going to start off today by asking you what your number one question is. So this helps me customize the content that actually comes out of my mouth um, as we're going through the program. So find your questions window and go ahead and chat in your number one question today. Uh, Jenny is going to help facilitate um, and moderate some of the questions, so she'll be reading all of those. While you're typing, let's go ahead and get started. So here's what we're going to try to do today. We're going to cover a lot of ground. We're going to talk first about a new way to think about your communications as an organization and how that really affects your workload and maybe a little bit different than how you have previously approached the communications tasks for your league. Then we're going to talk about what is an incredibly important and essential tool in doing really good communications both effectively and efficiently, which is an editorial calendar. We'll talk about a couple of ways to really manage content so that you can create a lot more stuff with a lot less work. So we're going to talk specifically about curating and repurposing content. And then we'll close with some more thoughts on how you actually get all that communications work done. All right, so we're going to sort of tie this back a little bit to what we talked about during our first session. Um, you'll remember that I talked about how good websites need to answer questions, solve problems, and inspire action. And I want you to keep those words in mind as we talk about your communication schedule overall. Just educating people, just trying to inform people isn't really enough. Those are the first steps, certainly. But if you're not answering questions that people really have with your information and education, then they're not going to pay attention to it. It's got to be relevant to them. It's got to answer a question that people have, or it has to solve a problem that people have, or it has to really inspire them to do something with that information and outreach. We don't want people to just read your issue paper and then just sit there. We want them to do something with it. We want them to talk about it. We want them to be inspired, to get involved, to go vote, whatever it is. So always keep these things in mind when you're having discussions within your organization about what you really talk about. Are you answering, solving, or inspiring? Now, who's going to do all of this work? Okay, Jenny was talking to me about the way that leagues are often structured and how to really connect that with getting the communications work done. And what I sort of concluded and what Jenny confirmed is that the traditional league uh, structure or chart really doesn't facilitate great communications. So what I'm going to do today is try to give you an alternate structure, not an alternate org chart, but an alternate way 
to think about the communications process and some of the different jobs so that you can figure out how to take the people that may be represented by these blue dots and get everybody engaged in the process. Denny, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, um, so in response to the first webinar, but really for many years, I've heard from all of you, I care about communications, I understand the importance of the internet, but how do I convince my board? You're so stuck in these blue dots that it's very hard for you to see the way to implement all this great stuff that you're learning. And uh, I really appreciate that Kevi and I talked about this because um, we both agreed that the strategy for changing your league really needs to be custom to you and your league. And that customization is best done with a one-on-one -on -one coach or in small groups, not in a big webinar like this. So to be clear, this webinar is not about how to persuade your board, but rather what to persuade your board to do. Um, you'll think about where you want to go and then use the recordings of this webinar series with your board to explain to them who don't understand what on earth you're talking about. Um, now, I'm sure lots of you are thinking, but I need help convincing my board. What can I do with this if they don't listen? So I have three pieces of advice for you so that you can kind of let that go while you're watching this webinar. Feel like you are learning the structure that, that could be interesting and exciting, be in learning mode, and let some of that panic about, well, how do I make this happen? Um, wait till after the webinar. So one, get with your peers. I love talking to people like Suzanne Carneros, Nancy Bickle, Elizabeth Leslie, Carol Lindstrom, Norm Turrell, Amy Herdstedt. All these people are online, and I talk with them all the time in new media, at events, through phone calls about how we get our boards to change what they're doing. And then check out what LWVUS has. Their membership leadership development program, MLD, and their SURE fellows have been doing this for years. So there are definitely existing materials and coaches out there structured in that smaller format, one-on-one -on -one, that can help you. But then also, I want you to keep watching what League Easy Web gets up to. With the new system rolling out in 2016, it isn't just about the software to run your website. It's also about encouraging small group discussions and finding peers who have similar issues and sharing best practices. And I think we will host more large webinars like this as well. So if we have enough League Easy Web users who really need help persuading their boards, we can prioritize including more of that support. So I just wanted to get that out of the way so you all can kind of get that weight off your chest as you listen to today's webinar. Thanks, Kitty. <laughs> All right, thanks, Jenny. So, if we're not gonna, if we're gonna sort of throw this out the window for today, then what are we gonna replace it with to add some structure to our conversation? This is the way that content gets developed. And so, when I say content is the shorthand word that we use for all the stuff that you write or design and share with people through your different communications channels, whether it's email or print to your website or social media. So, how does how does content really come to life? Well, you're getting together and talking with your other league members, volunteers, leaders within your community, you're talking about what do people need. And remember, hopefully you're thinking about answers, solutions, and inspiration for people. So you're getting together and you're talking. Now what? Well, someone has to create the stuff, right? And there are a couple of different ways to think about that creative process. You're doing too much of original content. This is true throughout the nonprofit sector. You're thinking you have to write everything that you're going to publish from scratch, which is completely wrong and which is why so many of you feel completely overwhelmed by this job. It's because you're doing it wrong. You're, you're doing too much original content. So we're going to talk a lot today about curating content, which is really using content created by others and how to repurpose content, how to recycle, reuse, remix the good content that you did create. When you really embrace this sort of three-part approach to content development, you can create so much more with so much less time. Okay, so I know that has got to sound good to everybody. Well, okay, so you figure out what you're going to write about, what you're going to create. You think about what you need to create from scratch, what you can get from other places, how you can repurpose it. You still have to figure out where you're going to put all that stuff and when. And that's where we have this sort of web around the website. And we talked a little bit about this last time. So your website should really be the core, the hub of your communication strategy. And then from that uh, emanate these different other channels. Everything usually connects back to the website. 
Um, so email should link back to your website. Your print pieces should have the website printed on them. PR media work that you do, again, you're usually directing people back to your website. Same thing with social media and flyers. The website should really be the hub. But, you know, when are we putting which pieces of content where and how often? That's your editorial calendar, okay? And we're going to get to that in just a second. But I really want to encourage you to think about this process. Think about the chunks of work that you see on the screen here as, to, as opposed to thinking about your traditional org chart, okay? So who's going to be involved? in these kinds of conversations. Who's going to be involved in writing original content, curating content, repurposing content? Who's going to be involved in actually getting that content out through these different communications channels? You're going to have multiple people within your organization playing multiple roles. This is not something that you can just dump on somebody who's in a little blue circle on that previous org chart. There's really roles for everyone on your board. Everyone in your organization can have a little piece of this or a big piece of this. When you work this way, again, you end up creating much more communications and much better communications with less work. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about what that really looks like um, on the ground. Okay, so we're going to talk about this idea of an editorial calendar. And again, this is really a document that you create. You can use any different numbers of software. You can use project management software. You can use um, an Excel spreadsheet, which is an example I'm going to show you. You can actually use calendars. We use Google calendars a lot. We have different colors for different communications channels. So you can organize this stuff in lots of different ways. But regardless of, or it could be on a piece of paper, regardless of what the thing actually looks like, there are a couple of concepts that you want to use as you're developing your calendar. And so there's a rule of thirds that plays into this in a couple of ways. Remember when I said you're all writing too much content? When you think about the number of places that you're putting stuff that you're writing, how many times you're emailing, how many times you're updating your website, how many times you're posting to social media, a third of those times that you're sharing information with the world, start with something new, okay? Only a third, and maybe even less than that. I would say a third is your max in a lot of cases. The next third, you want to plan to remix that first third. You need to repeat yourself constantly. If you are not bored, I tell communications directors this all the time, if you are personally not bored with your communications content, you aren't saying it enough. Because remember, the people on the receiving end are not looking at everything that you are producing. They're not reading everything that you're putting out there. And I know that's sort of heartbreaking in some ways, but it's the facts. So people are not seeing everything, which means you need to repeat your messaging doesn't mean you're directly just copying and pasting and slapping the same stuff everywhere. There are ways to do that, that sort of subtly remix it and recycle it, um, but that the core message in most of the work is already done. All right? So we're going to plan for a third original, a third remixed, and then as you're planning your calendar together, and maybe this is something you check in on once a month at your meetings, I say leave some space open in the planning because stuff comes up and you want to be able to merge in all of that stuff without completely throwing a wrench into your plan. So you want to build some of that breathing room into your calendar. Okay, so we'll we'll look at what all of this, you know, really sort of builds out like in just a second when I open up an Excel sheet, but I'm trying to give you the big context here. The other sort of rule of thirds idea or, you know, trio is that everything that you create from scratch, all that original content where someone is sitting down and writing original thoughts needs to be formatted to work in three different communications channels. If you can't create the message in three different ways, it's not worth your time. This is something I personally live by and encourage everyone else that does communications to live by. So what does that mean? It means you don't just sit down and write a five-page policy paper and say you're done and hand the PDF to somebody. 
Okay, if you need the five-page policy paper for a very specific purpose, it's answering, it's inspiring, or it's solving problems, then great. But you're not done yet. You still have to massage that content, reformat it so that it'll work in at least two different ways. So maybe you're turning that into a press release. Maybe you're creating a series of tweets that can promote this five-pager. Maybe you're writing a newsletter article that's only 100 words that can then promote what you're saying in the five-pager. That's your job as the topic expert, is to, whenever you are creating content, is to produce it in three different formats for three different channels, okay? So, when you're building your calendar, you want to map out your most important messaging first. And again, these are strategic conversations that you're usually having in person or on a conference call with people about what is most important this month, this quarter. You want to make sure that you are giving adequate space and time to those most important topics. So you map those out in your editorial calendar first. Then you take what you just mapped out and you repurpose it into another third of your communications slots, okay? And again, if something can't go three places, it's not worth creating. You need to be constantly building this idea that you're repurposing, reusing your content into the process of creating communications from the very get-go. And then again, you're going to leave some space open in your planning so that you can merge things in. Whoops, went too far. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is shift over to Excel. All right, this is a spreadsheet. Again, you guys can download this if you want or not. It's totally up to you. But what I have created here is just to illustrate some of these concepts. So you can see basic grid format here. Down the column, the first column is the time. So I've created this as a quarter on a page. When I'm planning with other people, I like to look about three months out. So I've got three months at a time here. Each line represents a week. And so I just have the Mondays listed here. Okay, so the week of February 1st, February 8th. Then we have a couple of really important columns before we actually get to the communications channels. This column right here is about what's happening out in the world. What is the context in which you are communicating? So in January, everybody's talking about their resolutions. In February, you've got Valentine's Day, so you might want to think about some love themes. In March, you know, depending on what part of the country you're in, you may or may not be entering spring. Um, but you also have things that are going on that are related more to your work. So debates might be going on. You might have some voter registration deadlines. You might actually have some primaries, again, depending on where you are. But that's the kind of stuff that you want to make sure is on the calendar as a reminder about the context in which you're communicating. Next, you get to your key messages. These are the specific things that your local league believes are most important. And again, I like to have these cover several weeks at a time. So maybe you pick a theme for the month. So let's just say, for example, that your league has decided that in January, you really need to focus on two things. One, some air quality rules that your um, league has some thoughts on. And also, you want to highlight the fact that your current voter uh, registration does not match the actual demographics. There are underrepresented people in your community, whether they're young people or maybe they're single women or certain ethnic groups, whatever it is. You really want to highlight this idea that your the registration rules aren't matching up with the demographics. Okay, so that's what you all have decided are the most important things. This is where the rule of thirds comes into play. All right, so we're going to talk about your frequency first. So maybe you're going to say you're going to update your website as needed, but you have a monthly e-newsletter, and that e-newsletter has three articles in it. And let's say you generally send out your e-newsletter the second week of the month. Okay, so that's why I've got these blocks colored in here. The e-newsletter is only going to go out when these blocks are shaded. Let's say you also try to send out some single topic emails. When you're trying to get people to do something, whether it's, and this is true for fundraising, for advocacy, for education, for RSVPing, when you're trying to get them to actually do anything, 
you are much more effective if you only ask them to do that one thing in the email. So while newsletters are great, you probably also need to be doing some single topic emails to motivate people to do something. So let's say you've decided you're going to do those twice a month and they're generally going to go out in the weeks that follow your newsletter. Okay, so that's why we've got the shading here and here and here and here. Let's say for your organization, email really is super important. It really is your main channel for getting the word out. Now that may not be true for all of you, but just for example sake here, let's just say that's true. Okay, so if I'm looking, I've got one, two, three articles and two single topic emails. I have five basically options in email, five opportunities to communicate in January. I have these two priorities over here. So if we follow the rule of thirds, I could basically do an article on the air quality, an article on the registration, and then I want to repurpose that. Maybe I do a single topic on both of them. And then my third is to leave it open. Maybe I leave this third article slot open until we actually get closer to January and we can sort of figure out what's happening at that point. Maybe there's something, you know, late breaking news that's really interesting, something new has come up, you'll have the space. All right, your email is full at this point. So if there's anything else you wanna talk about, you really need to do more communications. Maybe you need to do it more than monthly, your newsletter. Maybe you need to do more single topic emails. All right, and then same thing goes for these other communications channels. You figure out just how often you're going to communicate via event marketing, flyers, advertising, print, media relations, Facebook, Twitter, whatever channels you use primarily within your league should be up here in this column. And then you want to sort of have a, the, the average amount of frequency so that you really understand how many boxes on this chart you're filling in and then you're going to apply that rule of thirds. You're going to plan for original content, you're going to plan to repurpose content, and then you're going to leave yourself some cushion. Okay? So this is a good time to take questions. For some of you this is old hat, I'm sure. For others of you this is a brand new concept. So let's go ahead and pause and take some questions about where we are at this point before we start talking about how to fill this thing in with curated and repurposed content. So Jenny, what kind of questions do we have? Um, so uh, there's some people who are curious when you first start doing this, like how do you how do you pick? Like are there just, you know, like for getting started, they know they want to experiment. What are good numbers to start with? How do they how do they just fill this out the first time? In terms of how often they communicate? Exactly, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I can tell you what the sort of national nonprofit uh, averages are. We have very good data about that because we do an annual trends report. And so, you know, you're competing with all of these other nonprofits for eyeballs and ears, right? So I think this is good. It's good for you to understand. So nonprofits, something like 75% of nonprofits are communicating at least monthly via email. And for most organizations that have strong communications channels, it's more like weekly or every other week. So what I've suggested here with sort of the more traditional three article newsletter with two single topic emails, this has you emailing three times a month. This is not abnormal in any way, shape or form. This is probably even a touch on the low side. You could definitely do a single topic email every week and uh, or do an email newsletter twice a month. We're going to talk more about actually writing online content in our next webinar, but one of the things I'm going to tell you there is that it's much more effective to communicate more frequently with shorter content than to communicate less frequently with a lot of content. So I would much rather see you email, you know, two newsletter articles once a week than to put eight articles in a single monthly newsletter. So communicate more frequently via email, definitely. Uh, you know, the print sort of advertising PR depends a lot on your community. And this is where we go back to 
the core quick and dirty marketing plan. Who are you communicating with and what are the best ways to reach them? And what is your local media market like? You know, for some of you, getting in the newspaper is a breeze. You basically just hand them the press release and they print it. For others of you, it's extremely difficult if you're in a large media market. Or maybe you can only get certain things covered. So it really does depend on, uh, you know, your situation. In terms of social media, it's sort of like email. People think um, they, sh they should be doing it less when, in fact, you should probably be doing it more. There are a number of studies now that show that three times a day on Facebook is actually great for engagement. I've only put once a day in this chart, but that's probably really too low. You know, more like three times a day on both Facebook and Twitter is, is really the best practice. So, Kivi, I have a great question. Um, so, a lot of our members aren't familiar with sort of nonprofit statistics around open rates, how many people actually read things, how many people read their print newsletters. And my experience is that league members have totally unrealistic ideas of, of how, really how much yeah. people are going to read their stuff. Could you share a little bit more about what some of those trends are? Sure. So, you know, again, there are a number of different studies that. Um, are out there and so you'll see open rates generally what I tell people is if you're between 15 and 20 percent on an open rate for an email you're in the ballpark now obviously you want to be closer to the 20 than the 15 if you're if you're going below 15 you need to sort of look at that um, but a lot of smaller organizations that have smaller lists they know every single human being that's actually on the list you should be seeing open rates closer to 30 or 40 percent now, some people are like, what? Only 20%? That is a function of how the technology is. In reality, a much bigger number of people are looking at your email. It's just that it's not counted by the email companies unless you click on a link or unless you're um, seeing a graphic. So if you have graphics turned off and you don't click on a link, and yet you can sort of preview that email like a lot of us do, you're not actually counted as having opened that email. Now there's some little variations to that, but that's generally how it works. So you just want to sort of benchmark against yourself. If you start to see your open rates coming down, then you want to pay attention to that. But if you're getting a 20% open rate, it's really nothing to be panicky about. Um, now print, you know, we don't have the data about print unless you're asking people to specifically do things that you can then track. So that's one benefit that we do have over print with email is that you've at least got some metrics and the same thing goes with Facebook and Twitter and other online tools as well. Okay, great. And another question uh, that I have is, are flyers really useful? Um, we include one in our newsletter, but we don't know if use it? What about sending it on its own? You know, I really tend to think more of flyers is you placing them where people are going to see them. So, you know, again, go back to your target audience. The, the three questions are, who am I talking to? What's my message to those people? And then what's my communications channel? So if you're saying your communications channel is a flyer, you have to figure out, okay, where am I putting this thing? And who's going to see it there? And then based on that, what do I put on it? So, you know, maybe you've got really good friends in your public library system and they are completely fine with you, you know, putting up posters and flyers. Okay, well, who goes to that branch? And what do those people care about? What should you put on that flyer? Um, again, this really depends where you are and kind of how people move within your community and where you can actually put up signage. Um, you know, I live in a very small town in rural North Carolina, and I'm constantly amazed at how important physical signage is compared to things like newsletters, either print or email. Um, you know, the word gets around via signage and word of mouth in this town. And, you know, you need to understand how word gets around in your community and to make the appropriate decisions. 
And I can add just from other leagues that I've heard from that uh, a lot of leagues use pull-out calendars so that the flyers in our format that you stick it to the front of your fridge. And they've actually found those sort of reference sheets very helpful within some communities. Also, postcards are interesting that people are now getting less paper junk mail. Mm -hmm. And so sending out a really nice personal postcard with a really striking image, not horrible clip art or lots of words, it's a picture that people like that they will pull out of their mail and think, oh, that touches my heart or, oh, I get angry about this. Those postcards can actually be really effective too. So it could be that the flyer that you've been using forever just needs to be rethought a little bit. Yeah, and I, great point about the postcards. I love postcards. They're so much cheaper, for starters. And, you know, they are one of the few things that people will still look at as they are standing over their recycling bin going through their mail because they don't have to open an envelope. You know, you're just flipping the thing back and forth and then hopefully sticking it on the fridge or your desk or your bulletin board or wherever. So, yes, I'm a big fan of postcards. Okay, mm -hmm. so let's go ahead and uh, move through some more of this content. So I'm going to go ahead and get out of this Excel file and come back to the PowerPoint. So, you know, the idea here is that you are planning, right? You're sitting down, you're having these conversations about what's your most important key messages and then what needs to be created, how we're going to repurpose that content. But of course things are going to change, okay? But that doesn't mean you shouldn't plan. Lots of times when I'm coaching communications people in the nonprofit world, they'll say, oh, well, we had this planning meeting and then we didn't do any of it. And they feel like a failure. And the reason they didn't do any of it is because the situation changed and they needed to really merge in more than they had planned for. Uh, that's fine. In your next communications meeting, go back to those same questions. Is this still a priority? We had talked about this being a priority in January. Maybe Jane couldn't get around to writing the articles. It's still a priority in February. It's okay. You're going to be constantly making these adjustments, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't go through the exercise. Okay, so we've talked about editorial calendars. Let's go back and talk about how you actually curate and repurpose. If you'll remember, after you've got all your great ideas, you can create it from scratch. That's the original content. But you also really want to curate and repurpose. So let's talk a little bit more about that. Curating is the, you know, the fancy word for finding the good stuff. You're, you're panning for gold. And in our information age, there is a lot of fool's gold surrounding the real gold, right? And that's one of the values that you all can provide to people that are on your mailing list and to, and to your community is being that gold miner out there and being able to find the good stuff, the real stuff, and separating it from all the rest of the junk. All right, so how do you go about doing that? You have to be a good listener. You really want to pay attention to what's going on in your community. And you'll know that you're getting good at this when people start to tell you, oh, you are reading my mind, or do you have my office bugged? You know, people tell us that a lot when we put things on our blog. Oh, how did you know we were just talking about this? in our office. Well, of course, they don't have their offices bugged, but we do listen a lot to what's going on in our community. So we have a pretty good sense for what people are looking for. And we try to answer those questions. We try to inspire them. We try to solve their problems. If you're a little confused about, well, how are we solving problems? What, are, what questions are we supposed to be answering? You're not listening enough. If you listen, it'll be really clear to you what the problems are and what the questions are. You need to probably scan and keep up to date what's going on in your community. I, I probably, I think that a lot of you, just by the nature of your work in the league, are pretty tapped in to what's going on in your community. You're already looking at the stuff. So you need to sort of multitask while you're doing it and think, hey, you know, this is something that we could maybe use in the league, or maybe this is how I can tie something that we've created in the league to make it feel a little more newsy um, and a little more timely, okay? So work, work with multiple purposes in mind when you're going through all that stuff you're already reading. You also want to make sure that you're paying attention to who's doing it really well, whatever it may be so that you can let those people sort of own a topic. 
All right, let's go back to sort of this air quality idea. Maybe that's one of the policy issues that you're working on. Maybe you know from listening that this is a big issue in your community, but let's just say there's nobody actually in your league that wants to sort of take the lead on producing that content. So what you do instead is you curate it. You go find the people in your community who really do have the best things to say about that issue and you let it be their piece of pie. You just curate it and reuse their stuff, okay? But you don't have to be the one creating that original content. When you're doing all of this, it also helps you spot where the real gaps are so that you can really add something new to the conversation. When you're deciding to create original content, it's a lot of work, right? So you wanna make sure that it really is performing a function that no one else is performing. So you're really trying to find those and let the league fill them, okay? Don't duplicate effort within your community. If there are other experts on those topics, let them be the expert and just curate content from them. So how do you actually gold mining out there, you're looking for those uh, gems in the rough, you wanna follow sources and people. You can do that via searches, you can do it via individual human beings that you find to be particularly interesting or trustworthy. And of course, as a league, you actually have a number of people that are already sort of approved, um, ready to use content that you can curate. And um, Stephanie has given us a couple of links specifically to places you can go find great content to curate on Facebook and Twitter. Stephanie, you want to tell us a little bit more about these and some other resources Absolutely. you might have? Absolutely. So, um, you know, when I'm giving a presentation similar to what um, Kitty's giving now um, at convention or council talking about uh, communications, we, we often hear from league members um, concern over uh, approval channels and speaking with one voice and, and you know, if the, making sure the local league president is uh, approving all of the content that's going out on you know a variety now of online channels and so what we try and um, focus on is that everything that is coming out of uh, the national office or the state op state league office is already approved content that's ready for use for local leagues and so there's that chain of um, that uh, pyramid I guess that uh, all of this content filters through and so hopefully this uh, the repurposing portion third of the content that Kivi is talking about should be pretty easy um, from other leagues across the country um, as well as you know our partner organizations and news media and and other um, other groups so the the two links that are up on the screen right now are lists that we have created of all of the leagues that we know of that are on Facebook and Twitter. So if you go to this notes section um, on Facebook, there are actually two because there are so many leagues on Facebook, we couldn't fit them all in one note. So they're alphabetical by state. Um, if your league is not on there but is on Facebook, send me an email and I will update it and make sure that they're included. And the same is true for this Twitter list. So we have every um, league that we have found on Twitter is included in that list. and uh, if your league is on Twitter and not on that list, please let me know. Uh, we don't have as much control of uh, how that one is displayed, so you'll have to unfortunately go through the hundred or so leagues on Twitter. Um, but so this is a great place for you to see how other leagues are talking about different issues, particularly in your state or in your nearby communities. Um, and then, you know, just to, to echo um, what Kivi is already saying, that all of the content from our website, from our blog, from our action alerts, uh, all of that is approved and ready for your league to take advantage of and to share or to, to repurpose. So if we're sharing on, um, you know, a, we have an action alert going right now around methane comments, and if that is an issue that is really affecting your community, definitely tailor it to um, highlight the connection to your community and why it is so important in your state or town, and, uh, but then continue to push out the action alert and together we have so much more impact. And Stephanie, there is a question that I'll go ahead and pose to you if that's okay. Um, sure. What is your recommendation for, um, do people need to get permission from other leagues? How or when should they give credit to other leagues when they're curating content? 
Sure. So um, we ask uh, for our office that um, you would link back to the um, original source. So if you're resharing a blog post from our office uh, to do that, and you know we don't have a formalized policy on that, but I think that that's the best practice, and that's what we would encourage um, across the organization. If there are any questions or concerns about that, I'm happy to speak to them kind of more offline um, on an ad hoc basis. Uh, but I think creating those relationships, um, you know, we only strengthen the league by working together. Great, and I would just reiterate, you know, from a outside the league sort of culture of online sharing, you know, as long as you sort of give credit to people for the stuff, you don't really have to ask for permission. It's online already. So, um, you know, you can do that in a number of ways, depending on what channel you're in. In places like Twitter and Facebook where you don't have that many characters, there are a couple of conventions that people use. They either use the word via, like V-I-A, so via and then like the the username of the person you got it from, or you can also do what's called a hat tip, and you can just do HT and then the person's name. Okay, and that's another way to say this is where I got the stuff. Yeah, I think that that's great. I, and you know, Facebook has kind of a sharing functionality native to its um, platform, so uh, that's another you know super easy way. Any content we put up, you can easily just share directly from the league or the Vote 411 channels. Um, this, I think the important thing to keep in mind is how important the framing of whatever the link or the photo or the action alert that we're sharing is, and that doesn't always, when, when you hit that share button, it doesn't always move with that piece of right. content. So making sure that you are um, either copying and pasting it or coming up with your own that connects it more directly to your community. All right, great. Okay, let's Thank go ahead you. and move on. Talk a little bit more about curating content. So as you get really good at this, as you get really good at that gem mining, you're going to need to have a system to kind of organize this stuff. And again, this is really going to depend on the actual human beings that are doing the work and what kind of tools you like to use. There are social bookmarking websites. And if you just Google social bookmarking, there's ways that you can share content. You can use it with things like Evernote and Dropbox. There are a million different tools. And so what I suggest is that you just have a conversation with the people that are actually going to be doing most of this work and come up with the storage system and the, the, the tagging system that you want to use. So you can keep track of all the good stuff that you're finding. Then before you share it, you know, you can go ahead and share it straight out like we were just talking about, but you can also add some value to content that you curate. Maybe you're grouping random bits from different places. Maybe you find three articles about a particular topic, and so you put them together into a new article. Maybe you put things in a better order or sequence step one, step two, step three, or you tell people what's most important. You know, people are very busy, obviously. You're very busy. So when people start to get overwhelmed by all the things on the ballot or all the different things they're supposed to read before they make a decision about something, you telling people, hey, you know what, this is the best place to start. If you only have five minutes before you're going to walk into the voting booth, look here. If you got half an hour, look here. That's value. You're helping people by providing that context. And you can also put it in perspective, like Stephanie was saying. Maybe you are curating something from the National League, but you want to put a spin on it for what it's, you know, what it really means or how it's being discussed in California or Missouri or New York. Okay, so giving that perspective is also adding some value. All right, so that's how you curate content. Again, you do not have to create all this stuff yourself. You are not you don't have to be the smartest person in the room all the time. It's really good to know a lot of other smart people and to be seen as that trusted source that's bringing all that smart content from other places to your community. All right, let's talk about repurposing. Um, that's reusing the good stuff, whether you're creating it as original content or whether it's content that you curated from elsewhere, you are repurposing it. And the ability to do this well is without a doubt, what sets apart people who are doing communications in a professional way from people who are doing it in an amateur way, okay? This is probably the single most important thing that I see 
successful communications people and nonprofits doing versus people who are floundering and failing at it is how good they repurpose their content. You're trying to get your message across, you've got to repeat yourself. You don't have that much time or money or staff, so guess what? You've got to repeat yourself. It's the only way to get this work done, and you need to do it that way anyway to be effective, to actually get your message across. So it really is a win-win. So how do you repurpose? Okay, Very simple. You make the short stuff long and you make the long stuff short. Okay, So take short stuff. Maybe you've got some things that you put out on Facebook or Twitter that got a really good response and you think, wow, you know, people are really responding to this. Let's beef it up a little bit. Add some examples. Add some more details. Get some quotes. Maybe include opposing points of view, other thoughts, other perspective. You just add a little meat to the bone. You probably have a lot of long stuff that you need to chop up into smaller pieces. And so you can do things like take your newsletter article and just put out the headline with a link. You can reduce your paragraphs to bullets. You can pull out teasers. You can break it into smaller articles and run them as a series. Okay. Again, we're going to talk a lot about this on our next webinar about what we call chunking content, really technical term there, for how you write to succeed online. It's really about the bite size as opposed to, you know, the big old plate of food. Other ways that you can repurpose in addition to just sort of changing the length are to simply start an article in a new way. You can replace the lead paragraph. And those of you that read a lot of news and, you know, maybe you're hitting the news websites multiple times a day, you'll start to read the first paragraph and then you're like, wait a minute, I've read this story before. This is how the news media works, okay? They just update the first paragraph. And then the rest of the article is often stuff that's been published before. So you can do the same thing. You can also change the perspective. Maybe you write about an event from the perspective of a panelist and then you write about that same event from the perspective of somebody in the audience. Just talk about the same event but change the point of view. Easy, easy ways to repurpose your content. Okay, what you actually repurpose depends in part on what I call the life cycle of that content. And I'm a big girl. You have some content that we would call evergreen. It's stuff that you create and it's pretty good forever. You know, there may be little tweaks that you have to make here and there. But this stuff just really doesn't change for the most part. A lot of the website basic information like your About Us page, um, you know, some of the descriptions of your core programming, a lot of that ends up being evergreen content. You need to eyeball it a couple of times a year and just make sure there's nothing that's really changed. But you don't have to do much to it. Repurposing this content can be very helpful. Remember when I said you need to leave open a third of your editorial calendar to merge in stuff because stuff comes up? Well, what happens if nothing comes up? What if there's a really slow month? What do you put in there? Well, going to your evergreen content is a really natural place to go. Maybe you have an article on how to register for vote to vote. <laughs> in some places of the country, that's changing a lot. In others, it's probably not. So if that's standard content, maybe you repurpose that into your newsletter if you've got a gap. Maybe somebody doesn't come through and doesn't provide you content that you're counting on. Go back to your evergreen content and repurpose it into things like your newsletter and social media. Then you have what I call perennial content. So these are the topics that come back year after year, but they do require some updating. They are topics that are always popular or are going to be popular for a number of years. Uh, so in this case, you do have to update it, it, but you probably don't need to start from scratch every year. So for example, maybe you have an, uh, an issue on your ballot and you talk about it this year, but after the election, you go ahead and unpublish that website content because it's not relevant anymore right now. But guess what? You're pretty sure it's going to be what everybody's talking about again next year. So you sort of just leave it in draft and keep it. And then you can repurpose it next year. You can start with what you had, update it, and you're good to go. Then we have the annual color. Okay, so this is the much more short-lived content. 
it's stuff that you probably use a lot of in a very short amount of time, like event marketing. You're trying to get people to come to your forum. You're la 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 talking about your event forum constantly for six weeks, and then guess what? You don't talk about it anymore because it's over. So you can usually completely remove that stuff from your website. Um, you know, there may be other things like memes that you know are fun little things that you're participating in in social media. You don't have to delete that stuff from your Facebook or Twitter feed, but you probably don't want it on your home page for you know more than a week or something. Again, think in terms of the lifespan of the content and how you can repurpose the content based on the lifespan. Okay, so as we're wrapping up here, we've got about six or seven minutes left. Let's close by talking a little bit more about how you get things done. And then we'll do sort of a speed round of questions at the end. So as we've talked about this today, this is a system that requires participation from all of your leaders. This is not something you can pawn off on one or two volunteers and say, do the communications. Okay, it's really everyone's job. Now, those of you that have been doing volunteer work for a long time know, however, that when you say something is everyone's job, all of a sudden it's really no one's job. So what you do need to do is be clear about who is doing what, but making sure that everyone is really engaged in this process. So again, I encourage you to have this conversation. What are the ways we're answering, inspiring, and providing solutions? Who's involved in these sort of brainstorming conversations about what belongs in the editorial calendar? And then who is going to actually create content? Who's going to curate? Maybe you assign five different sources to different and there's lots of different ways you can do that. There's no org chart for the communication. It really depends on the individual human being. Who's going to report? And I would strongly encourage you to insist that people that are content creation are content. Remember, three places make it unless it can be used in three different And then you get into which then produces of content. So you can talk really responsible for what pieces. About the different roles that people can play, that they can plug in given their interests. From all the way of ideas, all the way at your open rates it is doing, which you're going to be able to do my your new system sure that all of these people, how their little piece fits into that big picture. They need to understand that, well, if I don't meet this deadline, it throws everything else into chaos. If I, as um, a subject matter expert, just dump a 10-page PDF on you without helping you repurpose that content, then that's a problem. Uh, people really have to understand this whole system and how their little bit adds up to something much bigger than themselves. And finally, as we wrap up here, I want to encourage you all to trust and empower your friends and colleagues in your league work. Odds are that they are there for the same reasons that you are, that you're trying to be a powerful change agent within your community. Some people are going to be better at that than others, and you can coach people who maybe need a little guidance along the way. But your default should be to trust and empower people and to really guide them along in this process, to not be top-down hierarchical. Okay, we, we as women get enough of that in all kinds of aspects of our lives. Uh, let's go ahead and trust and empower each other. Jenny and Stephanie, as we wrap up, do you want to add any uh, comments to how leagues work together in this way? Um, I would say, just remind everyone that there are leagues that have been experimenting with trying to, di to distribute how their communications are done, that have been pushing for this to happen. And so please get onto the New Media Facebook group, um, participate in local uh, 
communications meetings and reach out to people who are on this webinar and to each other. Um, it's, it's much easier if you can brainstorm with people who are going through it and can come up with ideas that really suit what's working in your league. So if you have three people that are really excited, then maybe the three of you form like this little committee that gets together and talks about how this can work and how do we work with these other people and maybe we only do this for like one set of goals and maybe not all of it at first. You need to be able to do that work and feel comfortable with it and not think, oh my gosh, we're going to overhaul our entire organization like tomorrow to make this work. It's, it's, it's hard to do that and that sets an unrealistic expectation. So just get help and, and get ideas. Stephanie? Yeah, yeah and I wanted to um, I echo uh, what Jenny was saying that if anybody has any questions for me, I'm happy to, to work with you or your league. Um, and we have a great um, set of resources in the handout section here. I apologize at the last webinar there may have been some problems opening some of those links and we think we've got those fixed now. And there's one um, resource in particular in that handout that talks about kind of what this webinar has talked about. So repurposing content and how you can create evergreen content. Um, you'll often see from the leak channels that we're sharing um, items on anniversaries or things like that and those are things we just have built into our calendar that repeat year after year and so you know we're building graphics um, and trying to share graphics with the leagues um, to take advantage of those opportunities and so small things like not putting the date uh, or the year on, on certain things makes them reusable uh, from time to time so uh, again if anybody has questions don't hesitate to reach out. Um, I know this can be a lot of information and you know we are really invested in making this easier for you, not, not more difficult. All right, great. So I know we're at the top of the hour, but let's see if we can just do a two minute speed round and I will try to answer as many questions as I can with just a sentence. Maybe I can do it without taking a second breath. We'll, we'll see how this goes. Go ahead and send in your questions now and Jenny, if you want to go ahead and uh, cue those up for me. Uh, and then just as a reminder, we have one more in this series scheduled. We're going to talk about writing for the web on December 2nd. So this is much more of a, a tactical writing workshop. Uh, writing for the web is very different than writing for print. Our eyes process the information very differently. People are reading on itty bitty little screens on their phones now. So we're going to talk about how to write to be read on email, social media, and your website uh, on December 2nd. All right. Fire away, Jenny. Let's see what see how many. Okay, so the get. first so, yep, so the first one is I'm starting to see Twitter twice a day. Please discuss this. It's very challenging to get volunteers to do that. So Twitter and Facebook, they both disappear really quickly from people's news feeds. And again, remember people are not going back hours and hours and hours. They're looking at just what's in their feed. Use a tool that helps you schedule those things so you don't have to actually get on Twitter five times a day, you just set it up and it shares it for you. There are a number of tools, Google social media management, things like Hootsuite, uh, let you schedule. Wait, great, and then another great question from someone. So convince me, why is sharing the same content three times so important? If you share it once, you might as well not even share it at all, frankly. People just don't see it you have got to share it at least three times and you are much more successful in getting things to stick in people's brains if they see it in multiple places. So that's why we say, you know, repurpose content and use multiple channels with everything that's important. Great, and there's someone who wanted to know a little bit more about getting coverage of the local league in local media. Do you have any advice for those strategies? You know, it really depends on your media market, um, but what I would encourage you to do is to get really specific. Um, there have been a tremendous number of changes within the journalism community. Um, they're super busy, just like you're super busy. Get to know the actual individuals who are the ones who are editing your paper or the producers of your local TV station and understand what they need from you and help them do their job. You know, write easy content for them. Get, a, get the people that they can interview on camera. Do their homework for them. Um, that's what really makes it easier for them to do their jobs in covering you. So get to know those people. Get to know what you can do, the legwork you can do to help them do their jobs. Um, here's a great question, and you went over this a little bit before. Um, there are organizations that I feel like I hear too much from, and I feel like as a communi communicator that I am over communicating. Can I really tell how much is too much? I feel like my judgment is off. 
So, you know, as a general rule, you probably need to be communicating more than you are. Like I said, if you are not bored with your content, you're probably not communicating enough. You know, the, the issue is really more about content as opposed to frequency. When we talk to people about why they unsubscribe, yes, they sometimes talk about getting too much stuff, but the reason that they feel like it's too much stuff is because it's irrelevant stuff to them. So this goes back to really knowing who you're talking to, what those people care about, what their problems are, what inspires them. If you're really communicating to people you understand and you're giving them what they want, they are not going to unsubscribe. They're not going to read everything, but they're not going to unsubscribe. And they'll read when they have time and when you present something that's really of interest to them, but they'll stay with you. The, the quality of the content is more important than um, the sort of frequency that people fear they're over communicating. Um, and I think we're going to need to wrap up fairly early. I've just seen a bunch of questions go by about this, and so I wanted to make sure we said it loud that, yes, there's going to be a follow-up email with the links to the materials and the recording and the Q&A, so everyone knows that that's going to happen. I don't see a lot of um, new questions coming in. One just came in, and maybe this will be the last one. Um, so how do you develop a larger mailer communications list? Um, and for that, I would also add probably to that question, Kivi, um, you know, is a bigger list always better? Well, you know, that's a whole other webinar. <laughs> but <laughs> I would say that, um, you know, it's, it's an ongoing process for starters. And you have to be delivering things that people want to get, right? So if you are positioning yourself as a trusted expert who is going to be the person that can solve my problem of, not knowing how to vote on the 30 different things that are on the ballot this year, and I know I can go to you, I'm going to be on your list. And you have to make it really clear that that's, you know, what your value is. That's just an example. You need to figure out what the value is that your league really provides to your community, that gap that you're really filling, that no one else is, is filling, the problem that you're solving. If you can articulate that very clearly and concisely to people, they'll sign up for it. You know, you have to, you, there's a value exchange in marketing. There's value in my email. So if I'm going to give you my email, what are you giving me in return? Okay, and it's got to be something that, again, answers my questions, solves my problems, or inspires me. Great. All right. Well, thank you all for hanging out with us today. I'm sorry we, we went over a little bit, but um, hopefully you all found that content to be helpful. And I look forward to talking with you again in December 2nd when we talk about writing for the web. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.